you had such a, a vast career, you've met so many of our great psychotherapy figures. I know that in the first 10 years of your career, they were spent in mainly psychiatric uh, departments. Yes. And, and since then, you've published many articles in both medical journals and psychological journals. How do you feel that this dialogue with the medical model, did it add to your sensibilities as a psychotherapy researcher? Well, uh, that's, that's a good question, actually. Um, and I think the first 10 years of my career, which was spent really right in the middle of uh, you know, hospitals, very uh, busy uh, hospitals with uh, a lot of uh, patients with very severe uh, psychopathology uh, 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 problems. I think it was um, really added a lot of breadth and depth to my uh, experience. Uh, I ran psychology training programs, internships we call them, in both uh, settings where I was, the last one being Brown University, mm -hmm. Rhode Island, at the medical school. And we actually had um, the, uh, the interns be on call to the emergency room so that they had experience in seeing the most acutely severe patients and could make decisions <clears throat> on whether to uh, admit them to the hospital or send them home, even though they might be uh, threatening uh, 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 harm to themselves or somebody. So it seemed to me it was very important as psychologist, um, and I think I had the advantage of becoming uh, you know, very confident in my, first of all, knowledge of the full range of psychopathology mm -hmm. and in my ability to really deal with the variety of issues rather than punting or <laughs> call, you know, so to speak, uh, you know, calling the more senior psychiatrist to come in if, if uh, the problem got severe. I think that's a, kind of an important quality for uh, many psychologists to have. And I think it benefited me. And also... Uh, so I never really, uh, we always work very well with our psychiatric colleagues in these settings because we were pursuing, um, well, we did our clinical work, but we were pursuing uh, research goals. We work very collaboratively in that regard. Sometimes the grants were on new psychological treatments. Sometimes they were on combination of comparing medications to <clears throat> psychological treatments and their combination. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everybody brought something to the table that was useful. So, you know, we, we never really had a strong clash of uh, fundamental <laughs> uh, epistemologies or views of the world or models from which we work. We pretty much work from a, from a, kind of uh, empirical uh, model by then. This is very interesting what you're saying because in m many mainstream psychotherapy uh, circles, this integration that you seamlessly do of the neurobiological medical model, it's suspicious for many of our psychotherapy colleagues. Why? I, I know this is something that's been going on for decades now, but seeing it from a 2016 percent, uh, per perspective, do you feel this suspicion towards the medical model? It's a historical artifact. Do you feel, are there any good reasons for it? Is it mainly competitiveness? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's overblown. <clears throat> I think uh, in the early days, uh, the, there were a number of components to it. You know, the medical model is a very nebulous term. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found when discussing it with my colleagues, that many of them mean different things one from the other. You know, in some cases they mean uh, simply a focus on treatment with drugs or more organic treatments as opposed to more psychological treatments. But there are many psychiatrists who do psychotherapy uh, and who uh, actually prefer that model, particularly in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, in the States, many psychiatrists have been forced into uh, 
just giving medications because of economics. Mm -hmm. But um, so, <clears throat> you know, I mean, that's kind of a, and, and there's evidence that uh, I happen to believe that the psychological interventions that we've all uh, developed and, and worked on and are the most effective yeah. in the long run. They, they, they have evidence for they're just as effective as drugs in the short run for a wide, uh, wide variety of conditions, and they're more enduring. Yeah. Uh, there's less relapse, mm -hmm. and there's now evidence, you know, that the medications uh, that there is uh, the the, uh, the bodily systems, the physiological systems, adapt in some ways to the medication that are, are not always in the patient's uh, best interest. In other words, there's isn't any, some, some untoward long-term effects that I think we're just discovering. So, but how, nevertheless, there's some evidence that medications obviously can be very useful, particularly in uh, individuals with acute psychotic conditions, but combining the psychological, integrating the psychological treatments uh, with the medications we know will uh, double the, uh, the efficacy increase survival time uh, to the uh, next episode. And so it always seemed to me to be kind of a uh, 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 <clears throat> something we should be working to look at, you know, what's in the best interest of the patient? Yeah. You know, what's really going to be give the most help to the patient? And let's look at everything that has, you know, based on good theory, a reasonable chance of working. And furthermore, I think we've learned We've known now for decades that the problems we treat, various presentations of psychopathology, are really organized in systemically in systems, and that you can intervene at different points in the system and affect the whole system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we used to assume, and this is where some of the medical model came from, we used to assume that you could intervene at the level of the mind and the mind is going to do its thing. Or you can intervene at the level of the brain stem uh, by you know, changing uh, certain uh, cell receptor physiology and that would do things. We now know that when we do our psychological interventions, we're changing brain mm -hmm. function and also actually brain structure mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, let's say, cell receptor physiology. Uh, in addition to attitudes, uh, behaviors, and, and, uh, and emotions. And similarly, when uh, some medications are effective, obviously it's changing not only uh, neurobiological variables, but also thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Mm -hmm. The question is, which one, you know, what's the best mix and match <laughs> and, and uh, for both the short and long-term effects, it seems to me. so. You know, that kind of definition of the medical model sort of falls down. You know, the other definition is that when well, you're treating symptoms and not underlying causes. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, I mean, that doesn't hold up. If you look at the totality of medical interventions, yeah, yeah. in some cases, the causes have been discovered uh -huh. and there are treatments that have been developed for, uh, you know, certain, let's say, uh, you know, bacterial uh, infections or something that lead to a variety of, uh, of symptoms. In other cases, we're doing palliative care, mm -hmm. and we do that both in, you know, mental health and, and physical health. Um, so, um, you know, we're obviously trying to do more than uh, just treat uh, patients uh, symptomatically, but on the other hand, um, <clears throat> we are looking for treatments that are going to have the longest term effects. We don't know the cause of everything. We don't know the etiology of everything. We're working hard to <laughs> discover it. Um, and uh, I think there's more collaboration and cooperation these days among, let's say, the neuroscientists and yeah. the psychopathologists. I just... Uh, it was just a special issue that you may have seen of behavior research and therapy on the uh, neuroscience of psychological treatments. And I happened to write a commentary on it. And I think 
you know, given that we having we're having major effects on brain function, mm -hmm. that we need to, uh, um, you know, look at that body yeah. of evidence. And indeed, when we do, as people like Michelle Krask mm -hmm. and others have done, we find that there are some hints there on uh, how we can improve our psychological treatments. It's been interesting to see how effective neuroscience has been showing up more in your work also. It's yeah, and I think, again, that reflects the times. Uh -huh. But I think it's also another kind of nail in the coffin of this medical model versus uh, all the other models that have uh, <laughs> proposed. You know, I think you have to have, you have, to have an integrative, multidimensional yeah. kind of approach if we're ever going to make progress in, yeah. in solving these problems and not pit one model against the other. That's my view anyway. There's actually one book you wrote. I think it's going to its eighth edition now in next year, the Abnormal Psychology one. Yes. And the, yes. the subtitle is An Integrated Approach. That's right. And That's uh, we, we were actually, we wrote the first edition of that book maybe 22 or 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time we proposed that, you know, we're going to have to take this integrative approach yeah. to most fully understand the mm -hmm. phenomenon we deal with. But at that time it was uh, very, uh, very radical, you know, and our, <laughs> our publishers would say, oh my God, you know. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> uh, yeah, will the, uh, you know, will the uh, instructors actually buy this book? Because they were used to teaching by the old, we call it the Chinese menu approach. They say, here's the psychoanalytic view, here's the behavioral view, here's the biological, here's the Rogerian view, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, of let's say, uh, uh, you know, anxiety yeah, yeah. or something. And, and here's the mm -hmm. psychoanalytic treatment, you know, in a separate chapter. Mm -hmm. Here's the behavioral treatment, here's the cognitive treatment. Here's the Rogerian treatment. Here's the drug treatment. So, and none of these things were integrated. It was just like, well, choose one from column A, one from column B. One. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, where's the student? Uh, you know, how's the student going to? So, we thought it was, you know, time to really begin integrating mm -hmm. the knowledge we did have. Yeah, you're touching on an important topic because many psychology students, including here in Europe and in Portugal, it's very disorienting sometimes with all the schools of therapy to kind yeah. of get a fix of where to go. One interesting thing that uh, distinction maybe we can make is that we talk here about an integrative approach, but it, it is slightly different from what some people might know from psychotherapy integration. You're not just talking about integrating in different schools. You're talking about evidence-based integration from different fields of study and of science. Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a member of... Uh, CEPI, mm -hmm. and obviously I think that organization serves a valuable function. We're looking at the integration, but I think it needs to go well beyond that, mm -hmm. and we need to, need to integrate you know, fundamental knowledge that's relevant to what we're doing from all fields of uh, inquiry, as, mm -hmm. as we just uh, talked about, including neuroscience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are still some different views, different readings of the psychotherapy literature. And I already had the chance to interview Dr. Bruce Wampold for what you can say the common factors, contextual model. So now yeah. I can't not ask you for your own take on some of these issues. So if you don't mind, I would like to play devil's advocate and ask you about a, a number of topics. Sure. And one of them, first up, is the dodo bird verdict. As you know, yeah. this conclusion that most major schools of therapy seem to have equal outcomes for most major disorders. Right. What would be your answer to that? Okay. Well, that's that's been you know it's been a very interesting uh, point of contention over the decades. And Bruce and I have uh, known Bruce for many decades, and we've had some interesting debates on the topic. And he's always a gentleman and a scholar, as I've, as I've told them about him. So he comes at it from a very uh, scholarly uh, point of view. And so these debates can go on for hours, point by point and point. But the, the, my general take on it is that, of course, what the so-called common factors are part of uh, any effective treatment, whether it be by the way, medical, mm 
or uh, or psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just psychotherapy; it's uh, it's medical treatment. Very powerful data that that we have written about ourselves, particularly on the effects of, uh, like, say, patient expectancies. Yeah. In fact, one of my uh, points I've been making lately in my lectures is that I think psychotherapists have been underutilizing the uh, uh, power of some of these so-called common factors. Uh -huh. So there's the notion that if you, many psychotherapists have the notion it's very important to form an alliance. Everybody believes that. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody believes that. Obviously, you have to ha uh, establish some kind of a relationship with the patient for them to properly receive the treatments you're giving them, mm -hmm. whether it's a pill, you know, mm -hmm. or a uh, psychological uh, procedure. Um, but then psychotherapists often stop, and they say, well, now we'll just see where it goes, Yeah, you know, this uh, relationship. Well, the fact is, we know that positive expectancies, when set up properly, are going to have very powerful influences on uh, cognitions and behavior, and for that matter, uh, neurobiology. Why not actively uh, incorporate them. that yeah. mm -hmm. into treatment? Some people, particularly those uh, of our colleagues who are studying placebo treatments very closely, and we have some... Uh, People here in Boston, such as Irving Kirsch, right down the street, actually, you know, they have said, you know, there are some actual things therapists can do mm -hmm. to maximize uh, expectancies. Mm -hmm. You know, we can uh, uh, show them the data from, uh, uh, you know, about patients, of the, you know, the percentage of patients who really benefited benefited in the past from uh, one treatment or another. We can show them uh, videos of patients talking about uh, mm -hmm. uh, their treatments. We can uh, give them some, uh, you know, basically operationalize expectancies and make it part of our intervention. Make it another module, you know, if you like. Yeah, you know, yeah. treatment. Well, there's too many therapists just sort of wait for it to happen, <laughs> you know, and hope it happens. Uh -huh. And uh, it may or may not. What you're saying so, seems to connect with the emphasis you gave on later versions of your transdiagnostic protocol on motivational, let's call it motivational engagement interviewing. But yeah. At a certain point, you put more of that. Was it? We trying, did. Yeah. We discovered, again, the data showed very clearly, data from people like Henny Westra and Hal Arkowitz and others, that rather than just hoping the patients were motivated enough, you know, and measuring them on the readiness for change mm -hmm. scale, mm -hmm. let's make them motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's uh, uh, you know, intervene on that with, mm -hmm. with module. And that module, of course, is motivational enhancement yeah. therapy. It's amazing that it took us until maybe 10 or 15 years ago to discover that we should be <laughs> actively intervening on uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. You know, initially, of course, we just thought it was for uh, the addictions, for for behaviors that were pleasurable but undesirable. Mm -hmm. So that that conflict. Yeah. But we've now discovered that no, it's it's also very important to do it for uh, emotional disorders, mm -hmm. even though they are unpleasant. Uh, still, people need motivations to engage them directly and to overcome them. So we need these common factors, we, we research them often, we, we've established particularly, particularly uh, expectancies mm -hmm. uh, and, and the alliance. But we also, we think the data overwhelmingly uh, 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 positive on the impact of our psychological procedures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and this is, I think where, in my view, people misunderstand what Bruce Wampole was saying. And, and others who also, I think, misrepresent what, what he says. Uh, but there's no therapist that I know of in the world who would take someone sitting in front of them with, who happens to be suffering from, say, bipolar disorder on the one hand, or a specific phobia on the other, and treat them the same way, assuming the common factors will do all the work. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. as long as you form a good relationship with them and, you know, get them expecting they're going to get better. It doesn't matter what you do. Mm-hmm. Well, anybody, including Bruce Wampole, is going to treat somebody with a specific phobia mm-hmm. with exposure. Mm-hmm. We know a lot about exposure. We know why it works. We know the brain mechanisms now underlying, you know, successful exposure. We know that it's not simply habituation, it's the creation of new memories, the work from cognitive science, mm-hmm. you know, overlaying the, the, the old memories. Uh, we know it's effective from decades of research. We know why it's effective. We're now learning how we can enhance its effectiveness. And so, so to assume, you know, that, that there's no evidence that it's effective yeah. it is, is, is just naive in my view. And every major policy-making body in the world now, when you go to, uh, let's say, the Veterans Administration healthcare system in the States, you go to the National Health Service in the UK, Mm -hmm. um, and look at other health services in developed countries, they have all had independent experts Mm -hmm. evaluate the totality of the data Mm -hmm. and have found that there are some interventions that work better than others mm-hmm. in the context of a good therapeutic relationship and mm-hmm. expectancies and all that. And they have designated them first line treatments. Yeah. And so uh, there's nobody, you know, it makes for a good debate. But in the policy, the healthcare policy world, nobody believes it. Yeah. That all that that interventions make no difference, so they all work the same. Mm-hmm. Nor is it what Bruce Wampole says. What Bruce Wampole the sophisticated point he's making is that you have to use an active treatment. Mm-hmm. Okay, he admits that. It has to be a very credible intervention to the patient. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and he admits that. It has to be, you know, something where the patient's actually changing his or her behavior. Mm-hmm. And he admits that. And he excludes everything else. He says if you have all those conditions. Mm-hmm then these treatments tend the, to work the, in some of the ways. The own frank conditions, the myth, the ritual. Yeah, mm-hmm. in the ritual. But if you have all those conditions, you mm-hmm. then have, mm-hmm. you know, basically, you have to, you're, it's narrowed down to one of the active treatments. Yeah. So, you know, Bruce Wampole, when you see somebody with specific phobia, mm-hmm. well, you obviously use exposure treatments. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a, I, I think it's, it's been kind of a red herring. It makes for great debates. It, <laughs> I think the unfortunate side of it is that a lot of therapists, with their confirmation bias mm-hmm. that we all have, you know, there's not one therapist in the States who thinks they're below average. You know, everybody thinks they're an above average therapist. Mm-hmm. We know that's not true. Lambert has uh, you know, done some, some great work on that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when he gives them feedback, mm-hmm. what do they do? They change their behavior. But he hasn't taken the next step and says, what specifically, how are they changing their behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they're now using evidence-based treatments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I I think the the whole debate, in my view, has been kind of a red herring. This is very helpful because you're kind of dispelling some myths about this dichotomous uh, way of viewing contextual and medical model. Another thing that's usually quoted, maybe you can help us to sort this out also, is this idea that the outcome is more predicted by the common factors than by specific techniques, which is also something that's said a lot, in a way. Yeah. You know, the, the problem with that, you know, I've seen some of those. And, and we have, there's, there's countless meta-analyses, mm-hmm. you know, showing that certain techniques, particularly exposure techniques, techniques and cognitive techniques, even some, uh, you know, in the case of motivational interviewing, some Rogerian techniques, countless meta-analyses showing that, uh, you know, certain techniques are better than others. And this is, this is what, uh, and some of them better than drugs, you know, or some worse than drugs. And uh, the countless techniques showing differences in, in approaches. And this is what the policy-making bodies rely on. So then you get these kind of post-hoc correlational you know, analyses that from some people and, uh, and they say, oh, the common factors, you know, expectancies and things, reliance, uh, account for a greater percentage of the variance. Often it's a very tiny percentage because these 
you know, the, the statistics are, uh, the st statistical analyses are very tricky. There's often restricted ranges in the outcome. There's a lot of things that throw off these uh, statistics. But uh, you get these uh, arcane, uh, you know, uh, esoteric uh, arguments among the people with the various uh, statistical expertise. Mm -hmm. Some saying, uh, well, you didn't account for this, uh, you didn't account for that fact, you shouldn't have, done, shouldn't have done this. And the people end up disagreeing. I don't think these post hoc, uh, you know, weak correlational analyses, mm -hmm. you know, of broadly you know, large uh, numbers of studies of different therapies really tell us much of anything. Mm -hmm. and pay, look directly at the effects of the interventions, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's in, uh, you know, and I prefer a more ideographic approach, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. focus on the individual. You know, look directly at the effects. Dismantle the treatments. Look at the active ingredients as we have with exposure and extinction-based procedures. Find out why it works. Look in the brain. See what accounts for it working. The fact is, no one pays any attention to these studies anymore from the policy-making point of view, showing that somehow, you know, all treatments are the same. It does give permission to therapists, and I think this is the unfortunate side of it, uh, who might otherwise be motivated to, let's say, through con continuing education or whatever, become familiar with uh, the most effective uh, new procedures it gives permission to them to just sort of keep going along the same route. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have studied this, you know, they've looked at. So it could become an ethical problem, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that uh, <clears throat> I'm not questioning for one minute, uh, you know, the, the ethics of motivation of people like Bruce Walpole, mm -hmm. who's, again, uh, I think a very scholarly. Uh, individual. But, you know, I think it, it does have the unfortunate effect of holding back the best care that our patients can receive. Yeah. You mentioned something very interesting about your work, the ideographic side, because there is something interesting that comes up when people think of evidence-based interventions. They sometimes have this idea associated with it, with manualized treatments, rigid interventions. And I read your work and you have single case experimental designs and this focus on the individual. So could you help also clear up a little this this balance you do between structure and flexibility in an yeah. evidence -based? Yeah, and I think that's another, I'm glad you brought that up, because I think it's another uh, misconception, at the very least, mm -hmm. you know, of a lot of the work that's going on. Um, obviously, uh, one individual differs from the other. Right now, we're working, uh, you know, under the sort of general notion of categorical classification. So we say somebody has a phobia, somebody has bipolar, you know, somebody has panic disorder, depression, et cetera. And that's a convenient way for clinicians and the whole field to communicate. But nobody believes that, uh, nobody believes that, that uh, that's the best way to classify psychopathology. Everybody agrees we, we're going to have to go to a more dimensional system. And individuals are going to differ on various aspects of that's the dimensions yeah. of psychopathology. And it's important that we, uh, I think, ascertain the individual characteristics. And so we're developing some new assessment procedures, at least for people with emotional disorders, that arrays people on uh, six or eight different dimensions, including temperament, but also types of avoidance behavior, and types of emotional experience, and triggers for that experience. And when you do that, <coughs> then it lends itself to really flexibly adapting our protocols to each individual patient by giving them, let's say, a, a better dose of uh, addressing where their real deficits uh, lay. And I think that's going to be the future of our profession. So I've been very critical of, uh, I've been critical of our, our own research methods that take these very nomothetic approaches that average in hundreds of patients and tell us, you know, on the average, the treatment A is better than uh, uh, treatment B, 
mm-hmm. for these hundreds of patients. But whereas the clinician is looking for information, what about the patient sitting right in front of them? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, do I take the average treatment? Or do I, and naturally, every clinician needs to flexibly yeah. adjust. We're hoping to, with our latest research, provide better guidance on that. Yeah. So more like steps or tasks, but of course you're not ordering like on session one we do this, on session two we do another. Thing. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some structure obviously to yeah. the treatment, and we know that it's best if the structure is followed. But there's also the notion that it has to be adapted. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, by the therapist uh-huh. who's, after all, right there on the front lines, yeah. you know, to the, the person uh, uh, sitting in front of them. So, of course, it has to be flexible. Yeah. Where you get this notion of inflexibility is among people who have freshly learned some of the protocols and they have a you know a book in front of them that sets out the <laughs> the procedures and typically we find they haven't had the experience mm. to really you know administer it to a patient so they end up like reading it and, mm. you know uh, uh, you know being very inflexible and not how they uh, uh, administer it. The same thing with diagnoses and uh, new therapists, newly trained mm-hmm. people often reify, yeah. we call it, reify these diagnoses. Mm-hmm. Say this is a real category. When yeah. that's meant also to be just a, a guide, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. you know, a flexible guide to describing the patient. So, one other thing important in your work, of course, was the development of the unified protocol, a transdiagnostic approach. I think we don't have to go a lot into that since, of course, many people have already heard about it. And I would still just like to connect this with a recent uh, interest of yours, some great articles you've done on neuroticism. And this uh, particular concept, it's so old, but you're giving it the 21st century take on it. Would you mind? Yeah, ir- ironically, yeah. Ironically, yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us yeah. a little bit? Because just to state this, so you recently made the case for shifting the focus of intervention to a higher order dimension of personality. Yeah. Um, we could call this the neuroticism. Can you tell us first where this emphasis came from, recent emphasis? Yeah. Well, it, um, it actually... Uh, it, it, it is, I, I'm well aware of the, of the irony also. When I was, many decades ago, when I was uh, uh, a young fellow like you, and uh, or even younger in training, mm-hmm. um, you know, everything was, neuroti- was uh, neuroticism and neuroses. <laughs> and, uh, uh, anybody who did not, uh, was not blatantly psychotic fell in the general category of neuroses, and of course there was an explanation for the ideology of neuroses. And Some borderlines. It was almost all, you know, back in those decades, uh, psychoanalytic thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was no neurobiology, there was no biological uh, uh, conceptions, or no behavioral conceptions. Mm-hmm. So, and then, of course, you know that the field changed, and by 1980, the term neurosis had disappeared mm-hmm. from the nomenclature, from the classification systems, mm-hmm. or at least most. Um, but in the late 80s, I wrote a book on anxiety and its disorders, where I sort of, I was on sabbatical and I had a chance to delve deeply into the nature of uh, emotional disorders. I wrote some papers on that back. 25, 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, it always seemed to me that these disorders really had more in common. They, they really, what they shared was more important than what differentiated them. Mm-hmm. And that the classification system had gone too far <laughs> in creating these little Separate. small categories. Yeah. And that what they shared um, in those years, I called it trade anxiety following the lead of Cattell back in the 60s. But I also noted in that book I wrote at the time that there were other terms for it. And uh, there was, you know, behavioral ambition, uh, there was harm avoidance, there was, uh, and of course, the old standby neuroticism. And, and 
But it seemed to me they were all really talking about, and negative affect was another term I'm often used. And it seemed to me they were all really talking about the same concept. Each person had a different spin on it. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Say, so well, what is this? And then we looked into it more deeply and found that there was a whole literature in the 1940s on producing experimental neurosis <laughs> in the laboratories, uh -huh. with animals mostly, and they could reliably do it, create these conflicted, extremely anxious animals, you know, who would cower in a corner, uh -huh. and it seemed to have some parallels. They discovered the causes of that. It was instilling a sense of unpredictability and uncontrollability. Yeah. In the animals, they discovered the biological underpinnings of it, particularly having to do with the HPA axis uh, uh, and uh, various uh, brain structures. And this was a common yeah. dimension. And even though the term neurosis died, the study of neuroticism continued. Mm -hmm. And so we picked that up about uh, six or eight years ago and said, maybe we should be focusing on this yeah. and treating this, this rather than each individual yeah. disorder. This common factor here. This common, this common underlying yeah. uh, dimension. Yeah. And so the unified protocol was an attempt to develop a set of uh, four or five core elements mm -hmm. along with some other that, that really attacked the neuroticism directly, the sense of uncontrollability, uh, the emotional avoidance, mm -hmm. and the dysregulation of the emotions which all of these people with all these disorders share. Yeah, so that was the kind of genesis of that. That's great. And, and how do you think that, because this is quite a, a huge leap to think of the idea that one uh, dimension could be in a way causally related to most of the emotional disorders we know, how do you think this will evolve in the future? Do you think this could, could have like an impact in all of our interventions? What's the scope of this? Well, we, we of course, are uh, uh, optimistic about it. We just finished a five-year clinical trial mm -hmm. where the goal was to, it was a, call it an equivalence trial. Mm -hmm. The goal was to see, is this unified protocol with just the five core elements or modules is it at least as effective as all of our different treatments yeah. <laughs> that we have for panic disorder, for obsessive compulsive disorder, for social anxiety, for uh, uh, depression, for um, generalized anxiety disorder? You know, is it at least as effective as all these different protocols? And the findings basically in one sentence were, yes, it's at least as effective mm -hmm. and in this big trial of hundreds of patients, uh -huh. uh, some of whom got the unified protocol, some of whom got the specific protocols that matched their diagnosis, yeah. like OCD, uh -huh. uh, that both groups were very much better than the control group, weightless control group, but the unified protocol was at least as effective and basically equivalent to the individual protocols, and there was less dropout, less attrition. Ah. And, the, and they found it a very uh, 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 credible and acceptable uh, uh, treatment. So we think this, you know, this is of course one study, and it comes from our lab, mm -hmm. but we think that, uh, you know, this implies that psychotherapists can take these powerful principles mm -hmm. and with one protocol do the work of eight or ten different protocols that were so difficult to try and master uh -huh. you know the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, principles and that it should be more efficient and uh, help in our training and our, in our dissemination that's a very uh, interesting line of research very enthusiastic that's that's uh, yep of course that's an optimistic uh, Assumption, but uh, we, we think that we're on, going down that road. Okay. We're drawing to a close here, David, but still I'd like okay. to ask you, uh, in the latest uh, edition of the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Psychology that you edited, the last chapter, you make some predictions on the future of the field. Uh, 
in terms of training, assessment, treatment. I'd be really curious if you'd like to share some that you think are especially urgent for the future of our field. Well, yeah, well, you're very well read, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a pleasure. <laughs> you're, uh, uh, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at those recommendations myself. <laughs> I wrote that chapter three or four years ago, but uh -huh. uh, so I don't remember exactly what I predicted. But I think, uh, you know, in a general sense, uh, we can certainly say that uh, our field is moving forward on a firmer footing, so on an evidentiary footing. Uh, we're we're uh, moving very much towards, uh, you know, evidence-based kinds of practice where we should have been all along. I think schools of psychotherapy are uh, an anachronism. They think of the past. They were kind of pre-scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, if you like, they served a purpose, but uh, in the face of the evidence, what we're finding is that there were important kinds of uh, kind of procedural contributions from all different branches of psychotherapy, and the evidence is now delineating which ones, which principles and elements, you know, are important yeah. and effective, right. and which aren't and uh, under what conditions for which patients would they be most effective. So I think we're going ahead in this uh, kind of a fashion. I think, as we already discussed, we're integrating important evidence from all branches of science relevant to uh, uh, mental disorders and mental health, uh, psychological well-being, and this kind of integration is going to uh, advance our thinking. It's going to help us to make uh, some great uh, leaps forward. I think the biggest challenges that we have by far are the issues of dissemination and implementation. So uh, as psychotherapists, certainly in this country, uh, the United States, uh, we just touch a very small percentage of the people really suffering mm -hmm. from the variety of uh, psychological conditions. You know, anxiety, depression, you know, the vast majority of people don't get any treatment whatsoever. The ones that do get treatments often get ineffective treatments, often drug treatments have mm -hmm. inappropriate doses mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, we now have effective psychological treatments. We know how to do that. We know how to develop new treatments. We know how to evaluate them. We're not always right and you know, <laughs> what, what they will be, but we, but uh, the harder task is really how do we get all these treatments out there to the people who need them? Yeah. And this is a very new area, a very new science, the mm -hmm. science of dissemination and implementation. Yeah. And uh, it was our, our colleagues working in global mental health, you know, doing some very interesting things in third world countries, mm -hmm. you know, getting brief, flexible, scalable mm -hmm. kinds of psychological interventions out. And we seem to be having some you know, wonderful results, often working with local health workers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to try to disseminate these uh, treatments. In our own countries, we need similar kinds of efforts. So uh, there's much to be uh, optimistic about. The field is moving forward. It's firmly based on science, but we have much, many challenges uh, in front of us we have to overcome. A lot of work ahead of us. Yep. I'd like to finish, David, with one last question for you. I have been asking all of our colleagues in these interviews, and that is very simply, after all of your career and all the amazing experiences that you had along the way, I would still be curious to ask you, what advice would you wish to have received when you were starting out your career as a researcher and therapist? Well, I think uh, I was very fortunate in that I had excellent mentors. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my mentors, by and large, had a very balanced approach to the field. They were both clinicians and clinical scientists, researchers. And uh, so I think um, by example, what they demonstrated to me was that you should always do both. You should have, you know, this kind of integration of your clinical work and your clinical research. And, and I always uh, have had that. I think, uh, so I've been very, very fortunate in that I think uh, my career has 
unfolded in a, in a very satisfactory way. I've been very blessed to have good colleagues and, and great resources and mm -hmm. strong support. Uh, so I, um, you know, uh, certainly feel like uh, I've been in a, in a very good position. And um, so maybe I should ask you what advice you would wish to yeah. give. To so I, I would think you know that. Uh, um, the, the, the one bit of advice, the one thing that's hard for all of us is uh, kind of striking the appropriate uh, work, uh, non-work balance, you know, balance between work and family. And we all struggle with that. Uh, everybody you talk to, who obviously you talk to some people who have been very successful and uh, very productive, and we all struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think maybe if uh, there had one been one bit of more structured advice that I would have gotten, and I think my colleagues might share this, is that there would, be, would have been someone who sat down and kind of really worked with us on how do you do this? You know, how do you have a, you know, both a productive, rewarding career? Uh -huh. Well, at the same time, you know, devoting the attention to other aspects of living, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, leisure time, your family, your, uh -huh. uh, uh, hobbies, your, 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 you know, activities that, that bring balance. And, and we, we know that your well-being, your overall well-being depends on, on that life balance. Our, our, uh, our female colleagues struggle particularly with that, hmm. you know, because of the... Uh, pull between the fa family obligations, you know, they, they very much devoted to and, and the career challenges. Nobody solved that yet. Nobody solved that for our uh, very good uh, female colleagues. Mm -hmm. and, but for the males, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some programs that have little tutorials on this. Yeah, they yeah. have lectures on it. They have a little, maybe a short seminar on it. Uh -huh. And I think everybody can benefit from it. More self-care in a way. More self-care. Yeah. David, yep. thank you Great so balance. much for this opportunity. Thank you. I'm very impressed with your, the breadth of your, and how, how well you're prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I enjoyed the uh, conversation. And I'm extremely happy to have the chance to talk with you. So I hope you continue with your productive work so we can rob it more. <laughs> <laughs> okay.